these all these um, set, set, sessions are recorded and we'll put them up on the website in due course. And so it gives me a very great pleasure to welcome Dr. Sally Pearman to this final um, session of the day. Sally is the relatively newly appointed Chief Executive of the International Confederation of Midwives. She has held a number of positions over the past 30 years in New Zealand as midwife, educator, and regulator, um, and a host of other experiences as well, which we have summarized on the website. But I don't want to waste time saying all of that, so um, I would like to introduce, would like to offer Sally the mic, and off you go. Thank you very much, Dr. Sally Pearman. Thank you, Linda. Uh, kia ora, everybody. It's, um wonderful to be here to have this opportunity to close the the um, conference. I can't believe really what an amazing opportunity this is for midwives all around the world to be in an education session together at the same time and I just think the work that um, that the team have done in putting this together and have been doing for years is really fantastic. So congratulations and thank you for inviting me to take part in it. Um, I, I, I want to say too, you know, that we're nearly, in, in the Netherlands anyway, it's 11 o'clock at night, <laughs> and uh, so International Day of the Midwife is almost over for us, um, but we've been in the office today and it's been incredible really because it's, it's been uh, full of messages and videos and uh, contacts from midwives all around the world constantly all day. Um, sending photos and in telling us what they've been doing and sending messages to each other and I think it's really quite exciting and amazing and I, I can see that Suiche, um is online and I, I want to just acknowledge her as our communications manager because she's she's done a phenomenal job getting ready for IC for IDM and also today almost almost couldn't quite manage all of the Twitter that was running so hot. So, you know, well done to Suiche, but well done to everybody. And I think what it is is a sign of how much midwives really enjoy um, being midwives and having this opportunity just to share the joy and the fun of it with each other, even if only for a day. But it's been fantastic. So well done, everybody. And it's, and it's great now to be able to close this session. I want to talk a little bit about, oops, hang on, I have to remember how to change the slides. Yep, there we go. Um, <coughs> I want to talk about who we are. And I mean, it seems like a, a bit of a silly question, but I think really the answer is not that simple. You know, we have an international definition that's been set by midwives globally through the International Confederation of Midwives. Um, we all work with women. And of course, with women is what mid a midwife means, at least in Anglo-Saxon Anglo meaning. And we all share an amazing opportunity. You know, we, we have that joy. We all share that joy of being with women in that amazing, wonderful, transformative life event that is birth. We are in that privileged position of being with women as they become mothers, being with men as they become fathers, we are with families, new families, families getting bigger. We hold new life in our hands. And that that we share as midwives. That's what brings us together. But our lives as midwives, as practicing midwives, is very different. And depending where we live, we'll have a big impact on how we practice and how what it's like for us as a midwife. There are huge variations across the world, as I, as I know you know. You know, variations in regulation, in education, in titles, um, in how midwives are recruited, how women even access education to even become a midwife, um, deployment of midwives, how our services are supported or not within our health systems and 
you know, all of these have a, have a really big impact on the way that midwives practice. There's been a couple of reports, and you can see the you can see the um, photos of the covers here, the SOMI port reports that I'm sure you're aware of, State of the World's Midwifery reports, but the 2014 report identified that midwives, um, you know, who are educated, it show, basically shows all of the you know the differences and and um, variations in many countries around the world. But what it, what it concluded is that midwives who are educated and regulated to international standards can provide 87% of the essential care that's needed for women and their newborns. And that if governments invested in midwifery education and supported midwives to deliver community-based primary maternity services, there could be a 16-fold return on that investment in terms of the lives that those midwives could save, the unnecessary interventions that they could reduce. Let's just move on. And we also know that midwives have different experiences. And this report, the Midwives Voices, Midwives Realities, that came out last year, um, it captured feedback from 2,500 midwives around the world. And it shows that while we know, and we know this, that midwives are deeply committed to caring for mothers and their babies and their families, but most often they're constrained by external factors. And some of the themes that were identified <coughs> excuse me, in this report show that midwives experience lack of respect at work and in their communities. Sometimes they are not safe at work, um, physically not safe, sexually harassed at work, um, that when they are you know, needing to, to live in um, provided accommodation, often it's totally inadequate. Um, they are not well paid. They don't get pensions necessarily. Um, and many midwives, all midwives, have difficulty juggling, and I'm sure we, we all understand this, the competing roles of being a paid employee, managing the home, and being a mother. There is also a lack of understanding by others about of what midwifery is. Um, you know, people just don't understand what midwives do and, 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 and what midwifery actually means. There's an increasing medicalisation that's happening for all of us in our environments, and a devaluing of the midwifery profession, inadequate midwifery education, and inadequate or non-existent regulation. So, it's it's and that's everywhere. It, it's not just in low-income, middle-income countries. It's everywhere. Excuse me. This is a, a slide from the um, a diagram from the report, but it's talking about the the barriers that midwives face. But underpinning all of these, of course, is gender gender inequality. And I, I heard a little bit from the previous speaker. Um, this is a this is a really significant issue for for us as midwives. Childbirth is women's work. It's seen as women's work, and therefore. Midwives have low social status because of doing that work. And as women ourselves, we also face then a double penalty in terms of uh, the gender impact. Childbirth and midwifery are human rights issues. And in 2011, the ICM adopted a Bill of Rights for Women and Midwives that called on governments globally to recognise and support accessible and effective midwifery here as a basic human right for all women, babies and midwives. Women have a right to care, to have care from midwives. Midwives have a right to have appropriate education, regulation and a practice environment in which they are respected and supported to practice autonomously and within the midwifery scope of practice. This report tells the world what midwives all know. That these basic human rights are still being denied to women and to midwives. And, and it's ironic 
because we know also that midwives are the solution to so many of the world's problems. We've got these new sustainable development goals now, 17. We could say that midwifery is only concerned with number three, that we promote good, you know, that we achieve good health and well-being. But <coughs> you can find midwifery in all of them. Midwives are the solution. And the World Health Organization has identified that, that midwives are a crucial resource to achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. There's lots of evidence out there now that care by midwives is safe, that midwife-led care produces better outcomes than care led by other health professionals, that midwife-led care reduces unnecessary intervention, that women are more satisfied with care from midwives, that midwives influence the uptake of public health measures, that midwife-led services reduce health service costs, and that midwives save lives. So there's much to be gained for countries to, that establish midwifery-led primary maternity services that are integrated within their wider health system. There's much to be gained by developing a midwifery workforce, making sure that, you, that a country has got access to edu well-educated, qualified and regulated midwives and that women can access those midwifery services. I want to turn now to, um, to talking a little bit about partnership. The theme of today, International Day of the Midwife. <coughs> and I think again as midwives we, we share this understanding about partnership, you know, because we, we do have this unique opportunity to work with women in a one-to-one -one and a very intimate uh, relationship sometimes. Um, but no matter what kind of environment we're working in, we are all with a woman, with women, during childbirth, during the childbirth continuum. And especially for those that can have that over time, but even for midwives who are working in environments where they don't get to know the woman before they meet her perhaps in the, in the maternity facility, we can still build a partnership relationship with each woman that we care for. And each of those relationships is going to be different because of the, of the partners, the two partners. But there's going to be some common principles. Equity, that, you know, that we respect each other. We learn to trust each other. That the relationship is reciprocal. Negotiation, that we talk through together, decide what to do. That women have informed choices. She knows what her options are, she understands them, and is able to give consent. That there is a shared responsibility and a mutual empowerment that comes from, from partnership relationships. Now, time, as I said before, is an important element, but every interaction with a woman can include elements of respect, information sharing, choice, power for her, etc. And these kinds of relationships are fulfilling for both parties. And they start to have a flow-on effect to the wider family, to the community. So when women have confidence and strength and feel really empowered through their experiences and relationship with their midwife, they start to stand up and to ask questions. And that starts to have an impact on their sisters and their mothers and their aunts and cousins and their friends, and, it, and actually, it can actually start to flow out through the whole, the whole community. And midwives have partnerships with lots, in lots of ways. Of course, the midwife-woman partnership is central for those of us who are practicing with, with women. We also have partnerships with each other. You know, midwives working together to provide care in a partnership, in a partnership. Midwives working with women who also have their midwifery students working with them. And the midwife educators that they are working with because nobody, no, it's, no, it's never just one person who educates a student midwife. It takes all of us. Midwives together forming the midwifery associations 
and of course midwife associations in partnership with women's groups, which can provide a very strong political voice. Through the ICM, there's a partnership of midwifery associations with the ICM. And the ICM also has partnerships with its global partners, WHO, UNFPA, JAPIGO, UNICEF, Save the Children, etc. And it's by working together in partnership that we can advocate for change with our partners. We can support each other, we can network, we can share resources, we can build strength, we can take the same message, we can advocate together to bring about changes. The ICM is essentially, that's its job. <laughs> and you can see here that, that uh, the vision of the ICM is a world where every childbearing woman has access to a midwife's care for herself and her newborn. We work with midwife associations to strengthen the midwife associations so that we can advance the profession globally and promote autonomous midwives as the most appropriate caregivers for childbearing women, keep birth normal, and enhance the reproductive health of women and the health of babies, babies and their families. The ICM is a non-government organisation accredited with the World Health Organisation. It has 131 member associations over 113 countries across the four regions of the world and represents over 400,000 midwives. So it can be a powerful voice for midwives globally. I think that the, that the ICM has got a, a really important role in holding the space for midwives and really continuing to emphasise and make it really clear that only midwives practice midwifery. Um, we, we, we have a, a definition, as I said earlier, about who a midwife is and those midwives practice midwifery. Nobody else practices midwifery. There's no such thing as another health professional having midwifery skills. They have their own skills. They might work in, in um, maternal and child health, and many do, of course. But what they, and they, they, we all share some underpinning knowledge, but only midwives practice midwifery. The ICM is the global voice for midwives. Um, it's up to us to, to, to always talk about midwifery, to always raise attention around what midwives can do and work to support midwives wherever they are to make sure that they are they do have access to education and regulation and practice environments that enable them to practice the way that they are educated to do. We work with midwives associations, our members in the regions really working closely with them, trying to strengthen them so that they can take that role and do that advocacy and, and hold that space for midwives in their own areas. Um, the ICM, through its, uh, you know, th through its council and through its, its governance structure, sets global midwifery standards that, that midwives around the world have supported. Those standards for education, regulation and the essential competencies then become a global benchmark which is really important um, for uh, contexts where you know, we're trying to establish midwifery education, for example, to have a set of standards that, um, that can be measured against is really important. The ICM develops and provides resources to strengthen um, midwifery and midwife associations. It contributes to midwifery knowledge and professionalism. <coughs> Excuse me. It also delivers projects with um, funding from many donors, and there are a number of different projects that are happening around the, around the world that the ICM is involved in with partners. Um, the ICM provides technical advice and support at a global level, and as I said, works with global partners, governments, UN agencies, etc tries to influence as much as we can the global strategies and policies that impact 
women and babies and um, maternal and child health care in midwifery and advocates for midwives and midwifery. Some of the, um, I just put a couple of um, fly, uh, pictures here of, um, you know, some of the uh, advocacy uh, strategies of, that, are, that are happening at the moment um, <coughs> that are important and relevant to, to midwives. And some messages around partnership. We all know this, the best partnership for a pregnant woman is with a qualified midwife. And that if, if we have high quality mid, midwifery care for women and their newborns, then we save lives, we contribute to healthy families and more productive communities. I've already talked about the fact that midwives contribute to achieving the sustainable development goals. And we know that midwives are key health influencers because we're trusted, because we're with women, because we're part of a community. Um, we are much, much more than a pair of hands during childbirth. So, midwives, mothers and families, raise your voices to advocate for midwifery and maternity services. Our collective political power can generate change. The services must need the meets of, meet the needs of women and midwives around the world. And that's, that's, the, that's the message that we, that we have from this International Day of the Midwife. We are partners. We are partners for life. Collectively, we have power and we need to use it together. So here we are, midwives, changing the world one day at a, one family at a time. And we know that that's true. That's really all I wanted to say um, to you to, to close the day. Um, I want to remind you, of course, of the next big event in our calendar. The, the, the Congress, which is coming up incredibly quickly, only a month away now. Um, and I'm really hoping that, that um, many of you are going to make it to Toronto. We're expecting over 3,000 midwives, which is going to be fantastic. Um, but just a little reminder in case you're still in case you're still thinking about it. And that's it from me. Um, I'm really happy to take any questions or any discussion. Okay, so um, can I ask if anyone has any questions? I have one, actually. Um, Sally, if you don't mind me starting the ball rolling. Uh, you mentioned that midwives should not be considered pairs of hands, and this nicely links with the question I was um, devising anyway. We've had a couple of presentations today from midwives working in countries where they are um, only used as pair of hands, where the, the medics consider them to only be capable of doing basic um, chores and not to have any um, autonomous ability to make decisions about the progress of or the care of a woman. Do you, think, do you see the ICM being able to do anything to help these midwives where they're struggling to uh, maintain, maintain normality or return to normality and physiological birth? Well, I think, you know, Linda, the ICM is up. Um, so what can we do? We can, we can join together, um, form an association if there isn't one in, in, in those countries. Um, but if we've got a midwife association, then we should be members of it. And then what the ICM can do, at least from the, from the, the headquarters perspective, is try to help to support um, those midwifery associations to actually build their uh, capability and capacity to uh, be able to advocate for midwives in their countries and to, to, to start to, to work out, well, how are we going to address this? How do we take the messages to the um, decision makers around, around our health system that this is a complete and absolute waste of resource um, you know that that uh, we're not using the skills in education of a of a health professional that's that's there that we have, um, and and we're we're using um, other health professionals like obstetricians inappropriately, actually by the sound of it. And you know I, I mean these these are not easy. I know these are not easy um, 
this is not easy to change because this is uh, um, the way that um, many, many maternity services have developed across the world. Um, and, and midwives haven't, are not at the forefront, they're not able to practice autonomously as they should be. And that's, that's, our, that's our struggle, that's what we have to keep working with. And I, you know, I've got to say that I still think, um, and, and we from New Zealand, we know this to be true, that if we midwives associations can partner up with women in, the, in their communities, um, build relationships with women's groups, build relationships with women and make a collective voice, take that collective voice to challenge what's actually happening. If women start to say this is not okay, this is not the kind of maternity service that I want, um, midwives are saying this is not okay, you know, that's how we can get the message heard. And, but it's, it's not easy, I, I don't deny it and, and it's certainly not a quick change. I totally agree. Yeah, that's our work. That's what we want to do is to, to make that change. Yeah, I totally agree with you there. And interestingly enough, as I asked that question, Bucky also asked us a related question. How can the ITM help midwives in developing countries, especially in Nigeria, to have a voice? Midwives in developing countries, especially in Nigeria, to have a voice, yes. Well, I mean, it's the same, it's the same answer. I mean, you have a midwifery association in Nigeria. Um, join it if you're not already. Work in terms of the association. How, how can you as an association get a voice? What is it that you need to do? How do you develop your, your, your capacity and capability? How can we help you in the ICM? Is there another association nearby? Are there others uh, within the ICM that can provide support within your region to help you build um, capacity, to help you um, build confidence? And, and really, it is about taking that step. And it's also about working with women and bringing women along with you to um, to get that voice to get that voice heard. Sally, um, Sally Joy Camp from the UK RCM has also continued that same vein. Really, what do you think is the role of national midwifery associations in better resourced countries in supporting global midwifery? Thanks, Joy. I think, um, I mean, there's several things, you know, one of them, I guess, is to, to keep being a member of the ICM, because that's incredibly important. Um, it's really important to the ICM, in terms of what it can do, that it has got a lot of midwife members. Um, and, and, you know, that's how we can actually be resourced enough to do anything effectively. Um, and I think that the what better resource countries have got a lot to offer. You know, they, they can um, they can contribute resources, they can um, offer support. I mean, there's been twinning programs in the past. There's, there's still um, in quite a number of places there are uh, midwife associations in, in well resourced countries working with midwife associations in less resourced countries and actually helping them to to build their capacity and the ICM can facilitate that and help that to happen. Um, but I think also, you know, they, in, in well-resourced countries you often have access to um, forums that um, other, other places don't have access to and so it's, it's up to us in the, in the well-resourced uh, parts of the world to also continue to take this message, even if we're in a country where midwifery is um, autonomous, where midwives are respected and so on, um, we have to continually raise it up and talk about the fact that this is not the case everywhere, um, that that women around the world have a right to care from a midwife and that it's, it's just plain ridiculous of, of governments not to recognise the untapped resource that they have. So we can all talk and we can all raise our voices in support of countries where there are a lot more issues than perhaps in our own. Cynthia has made the comment that um, she thinks one way midwives can develop a voice is to do more research and publication. Well, I think that's true. I mean, I think we've we've seen in the last in the last few years a huge increase in midwifery research, and um, I think it's it's fantastic that we're starting to actually get evidence 
about what um, what midwives can do and how midwifery care can make a difference. Um, and I think it's one. It's definitely one way. It's absolutely essential. It's totally important. The the thing that um, depresses me though is is how easily uh, dismissed often midwifery research is. So even when we have brilliant evidence from incredibly well done research, um, we often face a situation where those who don't actually want to hear the message or don't want to take on board the findings um, are able to dismiss it and quite often and very distressingly around in many contexts um, the media buy into this in quite a big way. So I think it's, it's yes research is important, yes publishing is important but um, we also have to fight the gender battle yet again to even get the findings out publicly sometimes. And your colleague from the ICM is pointing out that there's a Congress app um, to be so that you can keep up to date with ICM Congress news. That's very good. I seem to remember there was one in Prague. I think I'm sure I, I downloaded that one, followed that. Um, someone has also made the comment that we should be starting with the students. Yes, of course we should be. <laughs> well, we should be starting with everybody, but um, it's very, very important that our midwifery education programs are um, teaching students the values and, um, you know, um, the important uh, philosophical um, views of midwifery. I mean, our students need to understand what it is to be a midwife. They need to understand the importance of working in partnership with women. Um, they need to understand the gender issues that they face. Um, we need to be talking to them about that. I think it's really important that our education programs, um, as much as they can, find ways for our students to have ex continuity experiences where they get to actually see what happens to a woman and her family over time, through right through pregnancy, the labour, the birth, the postnatal period, because that is an, an, a unique experience that, that can change how you feel about what it is that you do. And um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree. I just think education is so important. We have to equip our students with the skills, the knowledge, the ability to to be midwives um, and help them get the confidence that they can practice. And I think we also have to help prepare them for the reality of the world they're going to step into. Um, they will see it as students, of course, but starting to actually um, do, do work with the students around how are you going to respond in a situation where, um, you know, you're, you're treated uh, badly by in a, by a, a, another medical practitioner or um, in a situation where, where something goes wrong. How will you challenge? How can you, you challenge what you see around you in a way that's not confronting but um, able to actually have an, have an impact? Um, which is depressing to say, you know, that, that we should also prepare them for the reality because what we really want them to understand and, and feel is the joy of being a midwife. Um, but it's a hard, it's a hard world out there for, for many, many midwives, and um, we, we we should be preparing them. But at the same time, we should be giving them confidence that they're joining an incredibly wonderful profession. So yeah, totally, totally agree with you. You can't go past education; it's so important. I was just about to ask you, Susanna, if you wish to actually speak the question, but I see you put it in the chat box. So um, one of the one of our participants' questions is, how does the ICM support midwifery research? Well, the ICM has um, has a standing committee, a research standing committee, um, as it also has for education and regulation. Um, <coughs> and the research standing committee is is active, um, gets involved with uh, with research projects. It's been uh, involved with the Lancet series, for example, the research there. Um, uh, sometimes members of the standing committee are representing the ICM in various forums where they are um, 
you know, bringing their understanding of research, their knowledge of research. Um, for example, I know there's, there's going to be a, um, a meeting uh, concurrent with I see with the Congress around, you know, helping plan a research agenda for midwifery globally. Um, so the ICM is really trying to support whatever is going on in terms of research and um, and through its standing committee mainly. Um, it also the standing committee is also undertaking uh, some small um, pieces of research. Of course, the ICM doesn't have you know we don't have a lot of money or anything to. Uh, to kind of run big research projects, but we always participate and have participated um, in them. We participated in the SOMI report development, we participated in the Midwives Voices, Women, uh, Midwives Realities, and so on. And that's, that's, a part, that's a role that we can play to um, enhance research. And of course, through the Congress. I mean, the Congress is all about um, sharing knowledge, um, uh, developing knowledge, um, supporting midwifery research. Um, you know, we've got four days of of fantastic presentations coming up in a month, um, and brought together by the ICM and again regionally. So it happens it happens uh, every three years um, in, at the Congress, but every other year there's a regional conference of the ICM which is doing the same thing um, to a to a smaller extent. Um, so it's all important, it's, and it's all about supporting research. You probably shouldn't be surprised by my next question, and, and that is, will any of the sessions at the ICM Congress be being streamed so that those who are not at the Congress can follow some of it? I believe that they will be, Linda. Um, the, I think the plenaries definitely are, but I, I'm not, I don't think that the concurrence can be. No, that's a little bit more difficult, really. <laughs> well, I look forward to that because that would be a good. You know, there's many of us can't um, can't get to the congress yeah. for one reason or another. So, well, I was going to say that, and I thought I wouldn't say that, Susanna. It's too expensive <laughs> unless someone's paying for you. So, um, yeah. it would be useful to get the information out to the rest of the world. So, streaming it would be a great way of doing this. We look forward yeah, to that. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was, I, th I think there's, there's, there's more that the ICM can start to do in that, in that direction in the, in the future, I hope. Yeah. There's always that kind of payoff thing, isn't there? Um, if you stream it all or lots of it, people might not come to the Congress. And you need people to come to the Congress for their money in order to put on a Congress and stream it. So there's a, there's a payoff there, isn't there? There is, but you know, there's something, there's, there's so much more that happens at a Congress anyway, isn't there, which we know, those of us that have had the privilege of going. I mean, to be in a, in a, in a environment for four days or, or a week with, um, you know, 3,000 plus midwives, it's, um, or 4,000 I think actually, I might be even underestimating it, it's, it's, um, it's incredible because it's just such a unique opportunity to, to be with midwives from all around the world. So the, the scientific program is really important and there's so much to learn and it's brilliant to see, you know, so many midwives actually standing up and presenting their work. It's fantastic. But then there's all the sort of networking and the connections and the and the, um, the socialising and there's the talking midwifery that goes on. That's, a, that's kind of a um, another whole experience that, that just adds to it. Yes, I, I agree. I, I tend to. If we can take some of that out and stream it and share some of that through the um, through the app and through the through the ICM website and through our Twitter feed, then that's what we're going to be doing. And um, and Suiche and and others are going to be working very hard the whole time to actually take the message out and take it outside of the Congress so that midwives everywhere can actually access some of it. Yes, but I do agree. It's a wonderful experience, especially seeing everybody in their national costumes, etc. I've been to three, I think, of them. Yes, three. <laughs> um, and it is a wonderful thing. But as someone has said here, she can't afford it on her salary. Um, okay. Yes, the BIDM is a great opportunity to have that virtual <laughs> feeling. There was, a, there was a comment made higher up, which um, I think we should be kind of closing in a minute, but uh, uh, someone made the comment that actually the, the well-resourced countries can learn from or learn from the, the poorly resourced 
countries in some ways. For example, breastfeeding, which we're not very good at, and they are very good at. I completely agree. And in fact, you know, it was interesting. We had a we had a lovely conversation today at morning tea ourselves in the office. And um, and and, uh, and the two of our colleagues were sharing, you know, who, who come from countries in Africa, were, were sharing the sort of the fact that um, <coughs> you know at, at a at a birth and when a, when a mother has a baby, there's there's incredible kind of continual support from her family and from the community, and, and it, it's everybody's baby and everybody's um, everybody's involved. And you know, I, I was reflecting on that and thinking that you know, in many parts of um, you know higher resourced countries, you know, we've kind of lost that. We, we, uh, we're we a little bit more isolated. We live in our in our houses and we don't necessarily have extended families that are involved with us in that same way or involved with our children. And, um, you know, I think I think that's a sad and I completely agree. There's a lot there's a lot to learn. I mean, absolutely there is. There's no way that um, you could say that the developed world or the um, high resource world have got it, has got it right. In lots of cases, in lots of ways. Absolutely. And Joy's made a final comment here. Um, she's really excited as she we have our twinning partners from Uganda, Nepal and Cambodia coming together with the RCM and Toronto to discuss the long term impact of twinning and reciprocal learning. That's that's brilliant. Fantastic. It'd be great to see. I wish I had been um uh hadn't retired before twinning had kind of really got cracking. <laughs> I would have loved to have got involved in such things. Mm, um, okay. Oh, yes. Yeah, she says, please come to our symposium. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> and Lola, um, <laughs> and Lola from the wilds of Shetland, I know, has made the point that uh, the loss of community of birth has caused so many problems. Yeah. Yeah. Because we've we've lost faith in ourselves, haven't we? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Faith in our ability as midwives or as women to, to give birth and that impacts all of us and that's what midwives, <laughs> that's our role to try and build that confidence back up again to trust, to help women to trust themselves. Okay. Fabulous. Anybody else got any questions? Do you know, I'm just delaying things a little bit. Sally, I'm sorry. Uh, I know it's really late where you are. Um, Deb is, is preparing our final slideshow, and uh, it's, it's, it's been a bit slow. So we're just waiting to see if, or whether or not she's going to have it ready for us to say Hi. Um, cheerio. Hi, Lorraine. <coughs> Linda. Yeah? Hi, I have a question, actually, who's coming here. So they're asking if the ICM conference in Toronto is going to be uh, on live by internet. Is there any way that it's going to be live through internet? Or is I asked that question just now, actually, but I'll let Sally huh. reply again. It's, it's my understanding that the plenary session um, will be live streamed. Um, so not the whole Congress, unfortunately. Um, and there's, there's so many sessions. I think it, it would be pretty. Um, it would be a pretty big tall order. But um, maybe in the future somebody will fund us to do that. <laughs> it would be brilliant. But at the moment, I think it'll be the plenaries in the in the um, each day, the daily plenary sessions, which will be live streamed. And then, as I said before, there's a lot of work going on in terms of the social media um, activity to try to get out as much as possible of the experiences that midwives are having. Um, you know, little interviews with interviews with people, stories every day, and getting getting that information out beyond Toronto, beyond the Congress venue. Um, around the world to midwives so that you can feel and experience some of it anyway. Fabulous. Okay, thank you very much indeed then, Sally. Um, that was about a very uh, very interesting presentation to finish off our, our conference. We, are, we don't think we're going to have our slideshow ready for um, tonight, so we're going to put it on Facebook and Twitter once it's completed. So we're not going to worry about that, and we're not going to keep you up any longer. <laughs> so thank you very, very much for coming and uh, honouring us with um, your presence today. And uh, maybe we'll see you again next year, or maybe somebody else from the ICM will come next year. It would be wonderful.
would indeed. And thank you, Linda, very much for your support. And um, look, once again, thank you to your whole team um, for doing it. Thanks. Um, I said before, it's brilliant and um, you know, really, really well done. And thanks, everybody, for attending. Um, it's great to see so many people here. Hello, special hello to New Zealanders that I've spotted. Um, and thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Okay, so there, we have come to the end of the IDM 17. Um, but before we go, finally, I think we should have a few words of thanks. Um, my colleagues and I have been working on this for seven months now, near enough. We start in September um, with a due date of May, which is not quite nine months, but it's pretty well there. Um, so I want to thank my fellow committee members for giving up evening weekends and sunny days. We've had a sunny week, and I've spent much of it at the computer. And in Scotland, sunny weeks are not very common. And we meet virtually quite often at antisocial hours to organize this conference. So my very warm thanks to everybody on the committee. Um, I want to also say thank you to our facilitators. Um, for their support of our speakers. Um, the facilitators do a one-to-one -one, um, sterling job at, uh, at helping the speakers get their IT sorted <laughs> um, and to understand the whole process of an online um, conference. And many of our speakers have presented this time for the first time on, in an online environment. Uh, I would also like to, speak, uh, to thank the speakers themselves for um, their presentations. We've had a wide range of subjects, um, and we've had more than a dozen countries represented um, on the IDN 17. Um, and we would like to hear from many more countries next year. I'd like to thank our participants, many of whom have attended a huge number of the sessions, and they've waited patiently while we've dealt with a small number of technical challenges. Um, and finally, I want to thank our sponsors who I mentioned at the beginning. And I've forgotten to go through the rest of the slides here. So someone is doing that for me. Um, I will just uh, complete it all by turning off our recording.